welcome everyone. I am so excited for everybody to be here tonight. We're here for Gardening with Native Plants Part 2. Um, our first one was so popular that we decided to do another one. We have expert uh, Stefan Weber back here again with us. He brought his friend Kristen as well. We're going to learn so much. Before we get started, uh, I'm just going to um, give a couple housekeeping notes. So just please make sure to keep your video off. We're going to turn off any videos that we see are on, but it just helps make everything run a little bit more smoothly. Um, we have your microphone muted. Um, so if you want to say anything to us, we want you to use that chat function. So excuse me so if you're in the if you're on a mobile if you click those three dots you should be able to go and click that chat button if you're on your computer there's a little chat button right on the screen there um uh you can if you can't hear anything press that join audio button and make sure you're listening to everything you're saying and if you have any other sort of connection issues or anything like that um we're recording this so if you you can just watch it later we'll be sending out an email with a link to the video um, Another thing, we, you know, we're the Long Point Bees and Land Trust. That's why we're here. Um, we're, we love to put this on. Our, our, where we, basically what we do is we conserve land throughout the Long Point Basin region, which includes Norfolk County, Haldeman County, Elgin County, uh, parts of Oxford and Brant. So all across parts of Southwestern Ontario. Um, we would love for you to sign up for our newsletter. You can do that by going to longpointlandtrust.ca. Um, you can also follow us at LPBLT. Uh, and you can do that at Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You can learn all about things that we're doing there. And then again, here we, I mentioned um, where we're located. It's in that nice little arrow, where that nice little arrow is pointing. So we're part of this really wonderful, incredible Carolinian region in Canada. Um, very, very biodiverse, really, really incredible things. And then this Long Point Basin is that little area right there. Uh, we have 10 nature reserves all across, uh, mostly fo focused in Norfolk County, but um, if you go to our website, longpointlandtrust.ca, you can learn all about the different things that you can see there. You can visit some of them. Really, uh, really, really incredible. Lots of uh, restoration work that we're doing. Um, some of them have some beautiful trails you can go check out. Highly recommend going to view some of those. And we'd be remiss if we didn't mention our incredible um, our uh, incredible supporters, um, all of these uh, incredible people have helped to sponsor these events today. Um, in addition to people like you, um, we wouldn't be able to do these without the help of you as well. Um, so, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is that we already have our next event ready and ready to go. This one's going to be um, really fun and interactive. It's a star party. So, um, our favorite uh, local uh, astronomer. Uh, is going to be there. He has, he's figured out a way to hook up his telescope to his computer. And so there's going to be some really cool things within view next week, um, next Thursday, August 27th from 8.30 to 9.30. We should hopefully be able to see Jupiter and a whole bunch of really cool things. And so if astronomy is your thing, I highly recommend viewing us. Um, and without further ado, then I will uh, stop sharing my screen and I will switch things over to uh to stefan um we have uh he's just yeah an awesome native plant uh person and he's gonna do he's gonna tell us a whole bunch of cool stuff all about seeds and everything like that tonight so stefan thanks so much for being here thanks for having me back again can you hear me yes i can oh and i almost forgot to mention um if you have any questions make sure to put them in that chat box i'm going to be there all evening and that's how i'm going to help to pop in and ask stefan any questions that you might have okay sorry go ahead stefan <laughs> no worries thank you i'm going to try to share my screen and hopefully that worked can everybody see my presentation Yes, I can yes, see it. Yes, I can see it. Okay, I'm just gonna go to full screen there. Okay, um, welcome back to part two. So last time I was just so excited. I included way too many slides. 
and tried to talk about way too many things. And I apologize for any of you who were here last time um, because I skipped over some things. So back to talk about the things that I skipped over. So we're gonna do kind of a quick recap um, from last time, just in case there's some new people um, who didn't join us last time. And then we're gonna talk about things I skipped over and we'll finish off the night with a tour, a really quick tour around my garden to show you some updates. And then I'll hand things over to my good friend, Kristen, to show her garden and some of the things that she's been up to. Okay, so um, I think, you know, we, we, we think that we have gardens and we have property, like we, you know, we put fences around things and we put addresses on things and, um, you know, some, some areas are conservation areas and some areas are gardens and really it's all the same thing. And I think we know that and I think it's important to keep that in mind always, especially when we're gardening and when we're talking about native plant conservation. Um, there's no good place for conservation, really. Um, conservation happens everywhere. Conservation happens with every decision you make. So um, I think to sum up last presentation and kind of the, the more philosophical stuff and the justifications for using native plants, it's really that, you know, your garden, um, is part of nature. It's part of the, the same garden that the forest down the road is part of. So there's this, this concept I've been just sort of toying around like, you know, there is just one garden and we can garden the whole world basically. And we are, whether or not we like it, we're impacting the whole world negatively um, with every decision we make potentially. So let's impact the whole world with every decision that we make um, in terms of our landscape choices and the types of plants that we put out there into the world. Um, so I am wrapping up a, another graduate degree um, in restoration ecology at McMaster University and it's been a really, really exciting time I'm working on some cool projects, restoring roadsides and studying invasive species and we we able we were able to turn some you know really degraded weedy roadsides into habitat full of native plants that would benefit pollinators and other critters. Um, so that's what I've been kind of working on for the last few years, and it's um, become increasingly obvious that we need more of these native plants all over the landscape. Um, and we need to be able to scale up appropriate ecological restoration material in order to meet some of those restoration goals. And that's not news, um, but it's more important now than ever, really. We're entering the United Nations Decade on Ecological Restoration, which really highlights the global priority to restore functioning ecosystems um, that are diverse genetically, diverse um, in terms of the types of habitat and, and, and you know, in, including the types of species. Um, so highlighting that we depend on these things and it's a priority for everyone to uh, actively bring them back to the landscape. The, you know, the degraded habitats are not going to restore themselves because humans are just too powerful but we can intervene we can find these small remnants um, and we can find these threatened habitats and we can actively restore them and by intervening at the seed stage in, in a plant's life cycle we can really kind of capitalize on uh, the plant's ability to scale itself up so one plant can produce hundreds or thousands even of, of, of seeds. And that's because in nature, the plant can't move around and put those seeds in an optimal place. It kind of lets, lets them go into the wind or get dispersed by a bird and those seeds could land anywhere. But if we intervene, those seeds don't just land anywhere. They land in a greenhouse in the hand of a gardener. They land in 
um, nice potting soil, like a perfect germination environment, and they're watered at least well enough to establish into the ground. Um, so that's what we can do as, as human beings, and we've been doing it for thousands of years. That's, that's agriculture right there. So we can grow food and we can grow ecosystems from seed and scale up seed um, to provide more restoration material and to create more habitat on the landscape, uh, which will provide more ecological function. So that's, you know, I think a good summary of, of why this is so important and why you should consider native plants and how ecologists and restoration practitioners go about um, thinking of what we need to create habitat. Um, but habitat, like I said, sort of happens everywhere. Habitat is the roadside, habitat is the median between the sidewalk and the road. Um, so we, we don't wanna miss every little opportunity for restoration. And I think there's an amazing opportunity to do good quality restoration in backyards, in gardens, in urban areas, and in otherwise kind of ignored waste places. So um, recently I've started working with Carolinian Canada on a few projects that are um, really exciting and have um, sort of outreach uh, programs in Norfolk right now. So one of the programs that Carolinian Canada runs is called In the Zone and it's a large garden tracker so it's a digital garden tracker that you register and sign up and you describe your garden. And we're currently tracking over 5,000 gardens, or I think it's just about 5,000 gardens. And uh, we get new people every day. I'm recruiting people all the time. And what we're doing is tracking the collective impact of gardens on conservation. And some of these gardens are very small kind of like my garden, um, you know, a simple suburban backyard. Some are half an acre or more, um, and some are even smaller. Maybe they are a, a balcony garden with a planter box with native plants in them. So that's conservation too. And um, some of those projects kind of slip through the cracks in other tracking programs, but in the zone, one of the really powerful things about it is that it captures um, the, the work and the effort of all these gardeners in restoring nature in southwestern Ontario. So that's really exciting. Um, I, I encourage all of you to, to register your gardens. Uh, let us know, you know what you're growing, uh, how, much, how much space you're restoring, what you plan to do into the future. Tell us stories about your garden. Um, it's, you know, it's free to join and you get all kinds of information about gardening, all kinds of things that I'll be talking about tonight, but so much more. So join up for In The Zone. Um, and then if you're, if you're really keen, you can also become a landowner leader. So this is similar to In The Zone in that we, um, we, we register your, your restoration project uh, with our landowner leaders program and we help guide you through your restoration project, um, including uh, monitoring or seed collection or planting and restoration. And right now in Norfolk, we're looking for folks that would like to be hosts for seed conservation orchards. So sites that can be maintained, like you would maintain your best veggie garden, um, but instead of veggies, you're growing a local uncommon plant um, to scale up for seed that can be used in local restoration projects. So this is like in the zone plus. Um, and you can, you can sign up for in the zone and then reach out to us separately if you'd like to become a landowner leader. We're also working on a somewhat more complicated project that I'm not gonna really dive into in Norfolk County called the Conservation Impact Bond. And this brings investors and um, outcome payers, so people who want to support and fund restoration and nature conservation on a large scale. It brings these two interest groups together with 
practitioners on the ground, whether they are conservation scientists or part of the restoration and landscape industry. And it finds ways to support the growth and expansion of green industry um, through, again, demonstrating collective impact and a long-term um, sort of scalable concept. So if you're interested, if you have maybe a farm or a, uh, a green business, um, you could reach out to us if you'd like. And we would love to talk to you more about the impact bond in Norfolk County. So there are um, co-benefits to restoration and there are co-benefits to creating seed orchards um, that go beyond providing restoration material and seed for more habitat. And some of those co-benefits include things like carbon sequestration or flood mitigation, but they also include things like economic benefits and social benefits. Some of these sites um, could be amazing ecotourism sites, um, you know, uh, cabins on restored prairies for bird watching or um, cross country skiing in the winter, uh, wildflower orchards as sites for your wedding photos, uh, sites for concerts, sites for um, art workshops, painting, painting, you know, lessons. All kinds of things. Um, so we're with the Conservation Impact Bond, we're really looking for innovative ideas that combine conservation um, with some of these other social and economic outcomes as well. So please get in contact if you want to know more about that. Um, but back, back to native gardening. Um, so plants are fundamental, right? They are the basis pretty much of every terrestrial food chain. They feed the bugs that feed the birds. And if you're not a native plant person, you're certainly a songbird person. Um, or else you wouldn't be on this call. You're, you're one or the other or both, I would say. So we, we grow native plants for their own sake, for their own conservation, but we also grow them to support all kinds of wildlife. <clears throat> pardon me. And uh, we grow a lot of milkweed for monarchs and other um, nectar host plants for pollinators. Of course, there's, a, you know, a lot of concern about pollinator decline worldwide. And so we plant native plants for pollinators. And some of those pollinators have very specialized relationships with their host plants. Um, this one depends on turtle head. This one depends on prickly ash and hop tree. This one depends on wild bergamot. And it goes on and on and on like this. But we can recognize that it's really good to have those pollinators on the landscape and then we can, we can provide for them. We can scale up habitat by saving every seed and by learning to grow native plants and by incorporating native plants as much as we can on roadsides in our gardens. So in Norfolk County, there has been obviously a lot of work um, over, over decades to conserve and protect and restore native plants. Norfolk County is such a unique and beautiful region. Um, I am from Norfolk County originally and all of my best memories are of exploring Norfolk County, Long Point and Bacchus and um, all over. So this is a really important place for a lot of people. And um, this plant I feel has really become an emblem of conservation in Norfolk County. Uh, it's the blue lupin. And when we intervene and scale up blue lupin and you know, create habitat with blue lupin. Um, we create habitat for all kinds of other critters as well, um, including lots of savanna and prairie habitat. And I first, this is the only personal story I'm going to share this time, and then we're going to get into some practical gardening. So um, my, my interest in 
native plants in particular started when I was doing a project for the University of Guelph Herbarium on the legumes of Ontario, the native legumes of Ontario, which, the, which to my surprise at the time, there are, there are many, um, and blue lupin is one of them. And in the process of um, trying to get little DNA samples from all of these legumes, I met Mary Gartshore, who is probably on this call. I think I saw her name. And um, she really opened my eyes to the diversity of plants that are in Norfolk County and showed me all of the native legumes that occurred in the county. And I was totally blown away. And um, this one is my favorite, the creeping tick trefoil. It's fairly uncommon, um, but it grows from seed pretty easily. And there's, there's few places where it will, it will thrive. It's a bit fussy, um, but it's kind of always on the back of my mind. Um, these are the types of things that are not necessarily protected in any official way, um, but through the kindness and thought and effort of people, people who really care um, and actually know that it exists. So there are so many legumes na native in our region in Haldimand and Norfolk, um, and many of them are a lot easier to grow and a lot more suited to a garden than the creeping tick trefoil. So I'm gonna share some of my favorite Norfolk native legumes with you. Um, green milk vetch actually, I believe is native to Haldeman County, um, but it, it grows pretty much anywhere you put it, um, on a sandy roadside, on a shady clay backyard garden. It's an amazing plant, pollinators love it. Sort of a orchid-like green spike of flowers in the late summer. There are many bush clovers, and my favorite is the hairy bush clover, the round-leaved bush clover. It's got um, sort of a, a wider spreading habit than the round-headed bush clover, and uh, just sort of a fuzzier, rounder appearance overall. Really cute and it loves sun and dry conditions. There are peas, there are wild peas. Um, this is a beach pea and it's found pretty much all over the world on sandy, beach, uh, on sandy beaches, pardon me. And it uh, is just absolutely beautiful, stunning. There are peas in the woods too. Um, these are that I saw this year flower for the first time. Mary showed me these about, I don't know how many, 10 years ago or more, and uh, they were not flowering at the time. And we went back this year and they were flowering. And it was a pretty, pretty cool day. Um, the wood vetch is a fairly uncommon plant in Southern Ontario, and you can hardly see it when it's not in flower. Uh, the pale vetchling, sort of the same thing. It gets covered and smothered by other plants as the season goes on. So some of these species are really hard to find in the wild and their seed is really hard to collect, um, but they are still threatened, you know? So if we're not pushing back against that threat by actively collecting the seeds of these plants, creating more habitat for them, then we're only going to lose them. And it's such a shame. Um, I think this is definitely the rarest of the native legumes. This is not a plant that I've ever tried to work with. Um, it's at risk in Ontario. It's the Virginia goat's rue. And um, I'm just showing this to you um, to, to demonstrate the variety and the diversity of legumes and of native plants generally in Norfolk County. Um, uh, but there's you know, pretty much one population spread out over an area of this plant left. And there are some very, very keen and dedicated people um, thinking of new ways to help this plant out. So stay tuned. Now this is another uh, at-risk plant in Ontario. This is the cucumber magnolia, and here's a tree in Norfolk. 
I'm not sure if this is a planted tree or not, but it does occur naturally in Norfolk. Um, and actually, Carolina in Canada was just successful in a grant application to the Species at Risk Recovery uh, Fund, I think that's what it's called, um, to study the genetics of planted cucumber magnolia across southwestern Ontario um, and compare those with um, the wild populations in Ontario as well as wild populations in the US to see exactly who they're related to and what sort of conservation value planted specimens have um, in terms of restoring Ontario's native populations. They may be related, they may be not related at all, but it's good to know and no one's really asked that question. So we, we did get funding for that and that's really exciting. So um, you can help. You can help conserve plants um, as well as conserving pollinators and creating habitat for wildlife. Every time you're creating that habitat, you are conserving plants. Um, and certainly, you know, the, the more plants, the better, is my opinion. And um, there are some plants that are hard to find, not because they're difficult to grow, it's just because no one's growing them or the seed is hard to collect and they're not very common in the wild. So these plants are not rare enough to be, you know, the target of any official conservation strategy. So um, we decided to form a community group called the Ontario Plant Restoration Alliance to work together to find these uncommon plants, uh, uncommon but not protected plants on the landscape to collect a little bit of seed from those populations and to scale them up uh, within the community to provide more seed to future gardeners and future restoration practitioners. And um, I think we formed in 2016, so not that long ago, but we have, um, we have gathered quite a number of, of partners and contributed to a few grants. Um, and we sit on the Ontario Biodiversity Council really as the strongest voice for um, native plants that aren't trees. Um, so there are, there are some wonderful organizations on the council, including Forest Ontario and um, the For, uh, Forest Gene Conservation Association. Um, but we are really the voice of all those wispy little wildflowers that support pollinators um, that slip through the cracks. They're in the conservation gray area. And uh, in the past few years, we've been working primarily in Hamilton, a little bit in London, Middlesex, as well as Toronto and Niagara. So we thought, hey, it's time to, to, to bring this to Norfolk County um, in terms of engaging the community in seed conservation and scaling up seed for restoration material. Um, so, if you have any kind of project involving native plants, whether it's a garden that you want formally landscaped with native plants or whether it's 10 acres of restoration that you're engaged with, please let us know about it. We may or may not be able to help you, but we at least would like to track that so that we can demonstrate the demand for native plants within the county and the opportunities to grow more native plants and to invest in the restoration sector in Ontario. So I've, I've checked off, you know, a, a few of the different things that might come to mind, but if you have any questions about a Norfolk seed conservation strategy in terms of which species, where the orchards are, please let me know. We do have one orchard going in this fall. I'm very excited to tell you. Um, we're putting in about you know 1500 plugs at the Bacchus Heritage uh, area um, close to the Heritage Village. We'll serve as a public resource, an educational opportunity, um, and just a, a place to look at native plants. Um, so if you have either private or public land that could host a native seed orchard, please reach out to me. I would love to hear from you.
<clears throat> so seed, focusing on a seed farm, focusing on a seed orchard um, is, is key and it, it, it checks off so many things. Uh, I think I've already mentioned most of these, but every time you create uh, a seed orchard, every time you create Every time you scale up seed for restoration, you're creating a green business, you're creating habitat, that's all kinds of pollinator garden. You are actually advancing the regenerative capacity of the landscape. So it's putting back into the landscape rather than taking from. Um, it's a site for education and outreach, um, bringing people together. I mentioned all kinds of fun things you could do out in this field, including just take pictures. You can make food with native plants. All kinds of native plants are edible and are you know, important um, hosts for pollinators and just gorgeous specimen plants for a garden, such as wild plum. Um, this is Kristen's jam. <laughs> so maybe she'll tell you how she made it, but those are the ingredients and it was delicious. And not only did you make a batch of jam, Kristen, but she also made um, hundreds, if not thousands of baby plum seeds uh, or seedlings. So every time you invest time and effort into growing native plants, you're kind of doing double or triple or quadruple duty. Um, so, the demand for native plants in Ontario was generally unknown. The last time anybody checked was like 2007 or something, and um, sorry, 1997, and it was only trees. So uh, OPERA, the Ontario Plant Restoration Alliance, we put out a little survey. It's still open and active if you have a chance to fill it out, but these are some of the early results just showing you um, how much restoration is happening that may or may not be accounted for, including green infrastructure and, and corridors like hydro corridors, including home gardens. So if you have some time, um, check out our surveys. We have two surveys up. We have a user survey to capture demand and we have a grower survey. So if you are a local native plant grower, we also want to hear from you. And you can take our grower survey. So here is a list of some local native plant nurseries that I've personally worked with um, through Carolyn in Canada and through the Ontario Plant Restoration Alliance. So definitely check out all of these really great establishments for native plants. Uh, everyone's growing different stuff and in different formats and it, it's so great to see the diversity and that the availability um, is, is fairly local. So there's some here that, that are closer to Hamilton, but um, there's a lot of really great native plant nurseries out there. So now we're going to talk about your garden and what you can do in your garden. And I'm going to do this pretty fast um, because after the presentation, I'm going to make sure that you have a copy of all the kind of info slides so you can use them as notes if that's helpful. Um, so I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, I'm also going to generally skip over trees. I'm going to mention a few of my favorites. Um, if you want to plant a wonderful Carolinian tree, plant a tulip tree they grow really fast and they have gorgeous flowers and that's about all you need they have a perfect shape <laughs> and grow tall and straight and are an amazing shade tree to support wildlife also consider cherry trees black cherry pin cherry choke cherry they come in you know a variety of different shapes and sizes uh, for a tree and they support all kinds of wildlife both while they're flowering and then later when they are producing fruit. So generally I'm going to focus on some herbaceous species and uh, I showed you this diagram last time. These are, I'm not going to say, you know, the most commonly used native plants necessarily. Um, a lot of them are, but a lot of them are plants that I've used at least for the last eight years gardening at home, at my parents' garden, as well as in my various gardens at Hamilton and now in Niagara. So 
um, basically these are the plants that I found are most bulletproof in a, in a garden setting and are also um, beautiful. They're either architectural in a way, they have a nice shape, they have a nice texture, um, or they have really gorgeous flowers or high wildlife value. So just to walk you through this real quick, I've got the little droplets of water tell you roughly how much moisture they would need. And the little sunshine tells you roughly how much sunshine they would tolerate. But it really depends on how much water you're giving them and that kind of stuff. Um, so the, the way I like to think about garden planning with native plants is doing things sort of in stages or at least having um, your plants organized in a way that they're going to complement their immediate neighbors. And um, I, I'm talking about trying to kind of formalize your garden a little bit more or at least give it some, I hate to say, order. Um, but recognizing that you should probably clump small plants together and larger plants together and keeping larger plants either at the back of the garden along a fence or something or in the center of your garden because they will more than likely need a little bit of propping up. Um, these plants don't grow in the wild generally with big patches of ground, empty ground between them and if they do they're probably one of the shorter plants um, anyway. So I like to start with, you know, laying things out in terms of height and moisture. So here I've got roughly dry on the left, roughly wet on the right. And I grew up with video games and I think of everything like a video game. I don't know if that's good or bad, but there you have it. And um, so I've also tried to rank these in terms of how easy they are to grow um, or, to, or at least take care of uh, from a potted plant. And they correspond with their little image on the previous slide. Um, so this is just kind of how I like to think about laying out the garden. And uh, I, I, I drew these little sketches because sometimes it's hard to pitch native plant garden design to people when you don't have sites to demonstrate. And I haven't done a lot of gardens. Um, I've done a few other than my, my family gardens. But these are groupings that I would recommend to people um, that would meet some general garden conditions and goals. So you have sort of a wet garden, I call that maybe a rain garden or uh, a somewhere near a ditch or a floodplain. You've got a, I'm calling it an Alvar rock garden, which um, these are all plants that will tolerate quite a bit of heat and drought and poor soils. So you can consider them for a rock garden. You could also put them in pots. I have pretty much all of these in clay pots and they do very well. I stop watering them after December 1st and put them in a shed for January through February. And that's about it. Bring them back out in the spring. So a lot of these plants that are suited to really shallow soils and dry conditions will, will do best in a pot. Um, if you're limited to a pot. So I've got the species listed there. Um, and then if you're after a, a slightly more wild and diverse and colorful garden, you're, you're aiming at something more like a prairie meadow full of wildflowers. Um, here's a list of really adaptable, rugged, bulletproof pollinator plants. I've included blue lupin here because if you're growing in Norfolk County, maybe you have really sandy soil and lupin really likes the sandy soil in Norfolk County. So you might be able to get away with it. If you live in an area that's a little bit more clay, you might struggle a little bit um, as well. So depending on your soil type, you may have to consider um, some of these choices, but generally all of these other plants will do okay in a variety of um, sandy loam or clay loam kind of soil. All right, so there's all kinds of guides. Um, you, you, can, you, you can use this presentation as a reference. You can sign up for in the zone gardens and get access to um, even more garden guides. This is one of my favorite gardening guides to come out recently. Um, 
called a flower patch for the rusty patched bumblebee. Beautifully illustrated. Um, and basically guides you through creating pollinator habitat beyond just plant choice, uh, but it also includes um, some guides for planting choice and like I said, some amazing illustrations. So um, you can check that out. Um, and here are some of the kind of garden guide slides that I put together um, to add to those little sketches that I did to give you actual photos of what these plants might look like and uh, you know which ones might do well together as a grouping. So this first set is for a mostly shady, so partially to full shaded area and um, mostly you know medium to dry soils. And I'm not going to go through each one of these plants now, but um, I just put this slide together so that you can look and compare and contrast later. Um, so some, some favorites like hepatica and other spring ephemerals like mayflower, uh, some that are more unusual and usually only found in clay soils, but they are actually really easy to grow garden plants. This is a twin leaf and uh, some, some native plant growers are growing this. This is my favorite shrub for shade, the Canada fly honeysuckle. Of course, you can't go wrong with blue phlox, and this is becoming more and more common. Um, it was available through the In the Zone um, program through Loblaws and Carolinian Canada. Some growers uh, supplied quite a bit of blue phlox in some areas. Wood betony is another unusual choice that I love growing. It's a hemiparasitic plant, which means it needs to grow next to a host plant, a grass or a sedge. The uh, wild crab apple is a small tree that grows in part shade and produces food for wildlife. Woodland geranium is an amazing choice for color in spring. I would also definitely recommend using a ground cover in all of your native plant gardens because it acts as a green mulch, as sort of a, a living mulch. And uh, a really good one for shade is the barren strawberry. So you won't get fruit on this, but it has nice yellow flowers. There's milkweed for shade, there's sunflowers for part shade, and there's goldenrods for part shade. This is a tiny little white flowered goldenrod called silver rod. And I love growing this plant. This is a blue stemmed goldenrod. And there are some uh, other uh, really cool vines. So this is a limber honeysuckle vine that will grow in part shade and um, grow towards the sun, kind of like a clematis. This is a really cool grass for um, texture in your garden and it's super drought tolerant. It's a bottle brush rye or bottle brush grass. It very, forms very tidy little clumps. Now here's a grouping um, for a full sun garden that's very dry and maybe you have compact soil or maybe you're trying to incorporate native plants into a rock garden. So you, you can't go wrong with prairie smoke. I think every native plant garden needs some prairie smoke. You can grow this in a container. Um, I've used it as a buffer between my stone path to the shed and the lawn and it flowers early in spring and then puffs out into some smoky seed heads later in the summer. Early buttercup is a wonderful plant for um, early spring color. I have this growing in a pot as well and I've just planted um, some new ones into the garden here in St. Catharines. Pussy toes. I had some spots, trouble spots, in my front lawn where the roots of a Norway maple came right up to the top and it was really dry and uh, the grass wouldn't survive and I planted some pussy toes in those spots and they're doing quite well. So it will fill those hard to, hard to fill shallow soil areas that are drought prone. 
Fragrant Sumac is an amazing choice for a dry, sunny area. I keep mine fairly pruned in sort of a, a globe, a multi-stemmed globe, uh, careful to not prune off too much of what will become next year's flowers. So I usually do that, you know, when the fruits develop. So I may or may not collect the fruit and then I'll give the bush a prune. Wild columbine, you can grow in a variety of places, but you know, dry, shallow soil um, is, is its favorite, I think. Um, it will come up in the cracks of your patio stones and in the sidewalk. This is another really cool uh, plant to consider as sort of a ground cover or a, or a border in your perennial garden. Robin's plantain is a really early flowering member of the fleabane group, which are native um, native daisies. Hairy beard tongue you, is, you can't kill hairy beard tongue. Um, you can plant it anywhere, sand or clay, part shade to full sun, uh, or in a pot, and it will flower for you consistently. Yellow pimpernel is a very delicate, you know, subtle plant, um, but it hosts swallowtails. It's the native version of a dill plant, sort of, and it flowers in the spring and it tolerates really, really dry, hard soil and both um, uh, a little bit of shade as well as full sun. Slender vervain is my hands down favorite drought tolerant little plant for a border or for a pot. Um, you really can't go wrong. It's like lavender, almost a mini, mini version of lavender. And nodding onion. We'll see some of these in my garden in a little bit. So um, you'll see how cute they are, nodding over. And everyone knows service berry. These are really, really hardy plants. You can plant in a container and leave it outside all year round. Um, you can plant it in really hard soil and it will slowly but surely thrive and flower year after year. So um, he, here's now some of my favorite uh, plants for a more wild prairie type garden, uh, again in medium to, to dry soils. So in Norfolk County, uh, we have this plant that I call the sand violet. Uh, I'm sure it has other names, but I, I call it that because I'm just kind of blown away at how well it does in open, dry, sandy areas. And um, there's not a lot of open prairie plants that bloom super early in the spring. Some of those, um, some of those kind of alvar plants do, but um, some of these sand prairie plants, um, you know, tend to bloom really late in the season, except for the, the sand violet. So really nice to include. This is a fun bush called the buffalo berry or soap berry. You can use the soaps, or sorry, the, use the berries to make uh, soap. There's a few different native roses, smooth rose or pasture rose would be great in that setting. And of course, wild bergamot. Uh, again, that'll grow in a lot of different places, but a big open garden is, is best for this plant because it does spread. New Jersey tea. This is the host plant for a rare uh, butterfly called the model dusky wing. And this is my favorite grass. I'm not a huge fan of grasses all the time, uh, but this is my favorite. This is side oats grandma and the pollen is bright red. And when it gets rained on, <laughs> it just kind of drips red stained um, water and it's just so gorgeous. Butterfly wheat, everyone's favorite. Can't go wrong in a dry sunny location. And here's a, a, a milkweed you don't see often for sale, but we're trying to scale up a local population in Norfolk so as to provide specimens to local gardeners and people who want to um, participate in the seed strategy. This is a green milkweed. We're also growing world milkweed from Norfolk County. We've got lots of these scaled up and lots of seed already um, to create even more plots of world milkweed. Um, and here again is my <laughs> one of my favorite legumes, the Canada milk vetch. And 
English clovers. Here is a plant that is the star of my garden and grows in dry locations um, as well as semi-shaded locations. This is the giant yellow hyssop. It is a pollinator magnet. It's very tall, um, sort of shaped like a candelabra and will bring all sorts of pollinators to your yard, primarily bees. Um, I also like to grow upland white aster or I call it white goldenrod in um, hard, dry soil as well. It's all kinds of native asters, including the blue ones, smooth and azure aster, but there's all kinds of different white ones as well. Um, so I'll scroll through the wetland species real quick. This is actually a, a photo from my garden about a month ago. Um, uh, just sort of blown away by how well the swamp milkweed did, even though it's not wet all the time. I do water them during you know, twice a week maybe during really hot weather, but otherwise they've been doing really well. Um, so if you've got a pond or, or a ditchy area that you want to restore, consider some flag iris, some blue flag iris. There are a few different St. John's wort, like this marsh St. John's wort that you could consider. And sedges. Sedges are kind of related to grasses, but they're way more exciting and they're way prettier, in my opinion. Um, sorry to anyone who's really in love with grasses, but I think sedges are where it's at. And this hop sedge is an amazing choice for around a pond or in a rain garden. And it will tolerate, um, you know, flooding in the spring and then drying out in the late summer. I like to plant pale coneflower in a wet location because it uh, it will grow taller and produce more flowers, basically. So it's not necessarily a pond plant, but I would put this somewhere that's going to get some water. Uh, same for bee blossom. It will grow pretty small in a sunny, dry location, but if it's growing in a wet, um, even semi-shaded semi location, it'll grow into like a Christmas tree sized plant covered in flowers. So obviously some plants will just do better with more moisture. That's just the case for uh, a lot of these things. Um, but these ones I would consider uh, in a rain garden for sure. Green-headed coneflower is always dripping with bees in my backyard. Um, it gets the sun in the early morning and in the late afternoon. And even though it's not always wet, um, this plant is doing really well. Same with dense blazing star, it attracts all kinds of pollinators. Again, it prefers a little more moisture than something like a dwarf blazing star or rough blazing star. Um, but if you water them well, they will get very huge. There's a variety of wetland asters um, that you can consider as well, and everyone's favorite, <laughs> Joe Pie Weed. This is a monarch magnet, holy smokes, um, but it does need to spread a bit. So give it some room, put it at the back of the garden somewhere maybe, or plant some slightly smaller things around it just to help it, you know, from flopping over. Um, usually I see wild plum in a, in a pretty ditchy wet area or next to a wetland, uh, certainly in heavier soil. So if, you, if you've got those conditions, you've got some space, definitely consider a wild plum and you can make jam. But if you've got more of a shady kind of swampy ditch, uh, a spice bush might, might be the choice for you. Really nice next to a pond. Um, the, the red version of, of bee balm, this Oswego tea, actually likes it pretty wet as well and, and semi-shaded. Another good pond plant. And then if you've got um, a semi-shaded area that floods, for example, in the spring, you know, that area between your shed and the fence, for example. Uh, that's a good spot to put something like Virginia bluebells. Really stunning color in the early spring. And this is a picture of Kristen with the bluebells that we collected seed from uh, a few years ago. Looking very happy to be out with, with the bluebells. It's really, really a beautiful spot. Um, so that's sort of a tour of some of the programs that I'm involved in right now uh, in Norfolk County, um, sort of why native plant gardening is important, ways that you can get involved. 
um, as well as some of my favorite native plants for, for gardening and filling some of those gaps in your garden. And so we're gonna, we're gonna shift over soon. We're gonna take a quick break. Um, I'm gonna go outside, show you my garden a bit, and then we're gonna hear from Kristen. She's gonna show us her garden and tell us about some of the growing that she's been doing for a little business um, that we are involved with. Um, so Seedbox is a collaborative plant studio, we're calling it, um, which involves a few different growers across the landscape. And we are set up for online sales primarily. And we really focus on some of these specialty um, native plants that are easy to grow and produce lots of seed and are unique um, additions to your garden. So check out the website for some cool plants. Seed box is a, is a native plant. I don't think it's native to Norfolk County, so don't, I could be wrong, but um, apologies for that. But it is native to the Carolinian zone in Ontario. And it's not a super aggressive plant, um, but it is very, very, very beautiful. And perhaps one of the most kind of surprising things about it is that the whole plant turns bright orange for the month of September and um, is a really beautiful contrast against some of the fall flowering asters um, and some of the other late flowering um, yellow, yellow flowers, goldenrods and things. Um, so it, it's a really nice perennial for your garden. It does like it a little bit wet, um, but forms a very tidy mounding almost shrub um, year after year. So my garden, a lot has changed since we were last together. I've seen a lot of leaf cutter bees and there's been a lot of drama in the leaf cutter bee community. It's still COVID days, if you hadn't noticed. So we're, you know, we're all working at home as much as possible, which means I'm staring at these bees all the time. And there's a lot of drama. There's also a lot of, ooh, caterpillars, holy moly, um, different, different kinds of caterpillars. We're going to see some that did well, like the swallowtail caterpillar on my purple angelica. And then we're going to see some that did not do so well. I've been growing some kind of new, new rare native plants in my garden, um, hoping to scale up seed. So these are some things that flowered while we were while we were apart: um, the winged loose strife, and just recently the large bracted tick trefoil, another native legume that I can't get enough of. So I'm going to stop there. We're going to pause real briefly, and I'm going to hand things back to Joelle for just a moment as I run outside. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to turn off my video. And I will see you in just a few minutes. Okay, well, so while we're waiting for Stefan to get all set up, um, if anybody has any questions, now's a great time. We can start uh, asking them and so he can um, keep that in mind uh, as we're going forward. Um, uh, I would love to know how many of you attended the first Gardening with Native Plant session. How many of you are here for the first time learning some of this stuff? Um, how many of you are based in Norfolk County or if you're from uh, around the area? Uh, put some stuff in the chat. I'd love to hear from you while we wait. Um, another thing I just want to mention again, don't forget we're having that, uh, that star party that's coming out. Um, so both June and, uh, sorry, Jupiter and Saturn will be in the sky and the moon will be just past its first quarter. So that will be really, really interesting. Um, yeah. Oh, getting some people coming in. Some people are from Norfolk County, Chatham. Uh, Haldeman County, Milton area, Niagara, Kitchener. Oh wow, look at all these people tuning in from all over the place. That's so exciting. Well, I hope you're learning a lot. I hope you are excited for the garden tour. It's going to be really good. Um, looks like lots of Belmont. Cool. Lots of really great uh, 
really great people from all over Ontario. How exciting is that? Very cool to hear. Um, question is the star party also a webinar? Yes. Um, the way it's going to work is that, um, burned the guy who's, uh, the astronomer who's going to help us out, the amateur astronomer, he's going to hook up his telescope to his computer. And so he's a way to, to hook it up, um, to visualize. And so he's going to be streaming what he's seeing on his telescope through the screen and into his computer. It's going to be really cool. I'm pretty excited about it. <laughs> Stefan, are you there? We can't hear you. We can see your beautiful plant, Stefan, but we can't actually hear you at all. Can you hear us? Hello, can you oh, hear me? There you are, yes. Okay, great. I'm gonna hop off again and let you take over. All right, I was double muted. Uh, the, joys, <laughs> the joys of technology. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is not a native plant. Why am I showing you this plant if it's not a native plant? Um, so I'm showing you this plant because right now it's the favorite of the hummingbird in our backyard. I don't really have anything that the hummingbird is going after other than this, and who can blame it? It's uh, gorgeous, right? It's a fuchsia and a lantana and some coleus. So this plant I've had for a few years, about three summers now, and I just bring it in every year, um, let it slowly wither away through the winter and then clip it back and bring it out again in the spring. Anyway, that's sort of our screensaver and my guilty pleasure. So there's, there, there's room for everybody. These plants are not invasive. They're not making seeds and spreading everywhere and they're gorgeous. And we, we do have a visitor. That's my cat there in the catio. Um, she wants to be famous. So anyway, um, she might interrupt us with a cry or two, but let's get to the tour. So I told you we were gonna see some caterpillars. Um, let's see if I can find him. I had a caterpillar with uh, wasps all over him, and maybe he's flown off. He's hiding somewhere. But that's my little tomato plant that I forget to water sometimes. Um, Stefan, would you be able to turn your camera so it's landscape, so you could, um, so we could see more of the the screen? Would that be possible? Did that work? No, it did not. Oh, wait, yes, it did. There we go. Oh, yes, there we go. Oh, that looks great. Good, good. All right, so these are all um, of my little plant babies that we've been growing that are going to go to Bacchus. These are some of them anyway. Um, so there's some slender vervain, there's some bee blossom, there's some hairy beer tongue. Um, these are my pots full of sweet everlasting. Oops, sorry, I'm going to stop doing that. And I'm going to take you to my fence garden. So where once there was a giant purple angelica, there is now this really lovely blazing star. So I do water this area, but it gets a lot of baking sun all day, um, pretty much. And here are all of my swamp milkweeds that grew really big and produced lots of seed. I collected the seed from the angelica already. These are some Riddell's golden rods that are just about ready to flower. They got some powdery mildew, but you know what? That's life. And it doesn't seem to be harming them all that much. You can see I have a few giant yellow hyssops. That one's well over the fence. This one that I have next to the shed is taller than me. Still flowering, beautiful candelabra. And I'm actually using it as a bean pole. I don't know if you can see the beans there. So I put some sticks to help support it in the wind and then planted some beans. And I get a lot of beans out of this little box. Also, I love nasturtiums, so those are not native plants but they're cool. This is my little mini, my little mini Elvar kind of garden that I'm calling it along the path. Those are all my nodding onions. Doing quite well. 
So it's getting to that time where um, it, it's going to be time to collect some seeds. So I actually have a few things that are ready right now. And I'm going to show you just how easy it is to collect and clean your own seed. So all you need, basically, a tub or some containers, like these little tin baking sheet things, and a variety of screens. So kitchen sieves. This thing is the base of a bird feeder that my dad gave me, and it works well. That's like an actual geology screen. And that is a handcrafted uh, wire mesh from the hardware store, ideally with a few screws and some tape. So it's really easy to make a screen to, to help you clean your seed. So we're gonna collect some seed real quick. Okay, sorry, my screen keeps going black and I don't know why. That isn't happening on our end, so. Okay, well, I hope you can see what I'm pointing the camera at. Anyway, this is called tall sink foil, this little plant here, and these are the seed heads. And you know they're ready when the tiny little seeds fall out and they are sort of a pinky orange color. So we're gonna clip this little head into our box. Ta-da, we're gonna do this one. Ta-da. Okay. So a lot of seeds are really easy to clean because all you need to do is gently shake them, rough them up a bit, and then put them through a screen. Pardon the honking. It's a very impatient person down the road. Okay, so you can see do those two little plants in a pot produce like, I don't know, it's gotta be a few hundred seeds there at least, right? So all you have to do is intervene and make sure those seeds don't fall on the ground or get eaten by birds and grow them. Um, and this plant needs virtually nothing to grow. So you put it in a pot full of peat-based potting mix, sow the seed just on top, just sprinkle it on top, and put it in the sun, and that's all you need to do. So you just clip it into the bin, and then next spring, sprinkle it into a pot, and you can have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of tall thinkful babies. So I hope that encourages you that the seed conservation stuff is actually really super easy, um, and we're gonna try to look for this caterpillar again, maybe while we hand things over to Krista. So it was a hornworm caterpillar that had little white cocoon cases all over it from which emerged parasitoid wasps. And he may have totally died and fallen and been eaten, um, but I kind of wanted you to, wanted to gross you out with, with the picture of the caterpillar. Anywho, so it's been fun. Oh gosh, uh, I love talking about plants. And thank you to everyone for joining me on my little tour here. And now we're gonna see what Kristen has been up to. I'm gonna stop sharing for just a minute. Okay, um, while Kristen gets set up, um, Kristen, you can unmute, you can share your screen. Um, Stefan, maybe you could answer a couple questions. Oh, there she is. Hello. Okay. That was awesome. Nice and quick. Cool. All right, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to, the one thing is, I guess, trying to figure out how to, oh, okay, here we go. Turn my camera around, but maybe I'll introduce myself a little bit first. Um, so, I actually started out, I went to the Niagara Park School of Horticulture, sorry. Um, so I actually started in ornamental horticulture, um, but even there, I just started falling in love with native plants. Um, 
I was a part of a, a seed collection program there. And that sort of, I guess, sent me on my journey. Um, I now um, split my time between uh, working for St. William's Nursery as well as the Forest Gene Conservation Association. Um, and recently I've been kind of helping Stefan out with uh, some special plants for some of his projects um, and as well as growing, growing some plants for uh, seed box. So I'll just quickly show you lots of plants of some of the things Stefan was talking about um, that'll be available for sale through the um, studio there. And we'll maybe take a quick walk out into my yard. So I've got a fairly big yard, um, a lot of veggie garden, that sort of thing. I've got grapes, so I'm not totally native, <laughs> but most of my non-native plants are food plants. So just a couple things here. Um, so I'll actually maybe take you into the main part of native plant garden first. So you can see it's a pretty big, I guess I'll raise. I've got quite a few plants, <laughs> if you can't tell. Uh, I love native plants. So just a couple things. Um, so even though I'm sort of in the native plant world, I've that start in ornamental horticulture um, taught me a lot and I bring some of those, especially design principles and that sort of thing into my native plant gardening um, and growing as well. It's taught me a lot about growing plants as well and, and what they need, what to look out for. Um, so here's just like, I wanna give you a bit of an example. When you're thinking about your garden and, and planning, I, if you ever have a hard time, sometimes it can be really overwhelming to look at one big area. And even if it's a small yard, it can seem overwhelming. Where do you start? Um, I recommend almost pretending like you're a photographer and, oh, it's uh, Leatris. But if you take a look like you're a photographer and kind of take a snapshot and think about whether you have all the elements that, that you need. So some of the things to think about, a lot of times gardeners get caught up in just pretty flower colors. Um, I like purple, I love purple flowers, I want it to be big, bold, and beautiful. Um, but generally, I, I try and encourage to look at some of the other things, form, texture, color, height, um, that's gonna really help your garden be well-rounded versus just looking at an individual plant and being like, I like that one plant. I like to look at my garden as a whole. Um, and as Stefan described about how plants can work together, planting um, plants that are sometimes of similar height to help hold each other up. Uh, grasses are usually really great for things like that. So I'll just show you a couple plants here. This is that upland white aster that Stefan was talking about. Really cool, great pollinator plant. And those nodding wild onions. And yeah, of course, the liatris. Now this plant is just an amazing plant um, for pollinators, especially monarchs. Like a lot of times we focus on just specifically host plants for the larva larval stage of monarchs, but what's really important, especially on the northern edge of their range, is, is nectar plants late season. So these late season flowers, blazing stars, goldenrods are really important food sources for, for these butterflies. Show you a couple of things here. This is a uh, beard tongue. It's just about coming into seed. It's long since done. But you can see it's still adding color, it's still adding texture, and you have that bergamot background, so there's contrast. So you can, even when plants are not in bloom, they can still provide and add interest to your garden. 
Let's show you guys around. These are those world milkweeds Stefan was talking about. Pretty well out of flower, going into seed now. Things like that that are generally a very fine texture like that, them plants together and having them in a backdrop of say, in this case, I've got some other plants that are a little bit more bold texture mixed in. Here's those prairie smokes. Generally try and keeping those on the front border of your garden. They're a pretty small plant. They're one of the first things to bloom in this garden here in the spring for me. Some sweet oxi in the background. So you can see I've sort of got plants staged. You have small things like prairie smoke out front. Some other smaller plants, bergamos, mints, um, blazing stars, and sweet oxi in the very back. I've got a couple trees planted in here to hopefully come in soon. And here, <laughs> some of these plants, they've a couple, a couple weeks ago um, to a month ago, were really in peak. So that's my butterfly milkweed there with all the seed pods on it and that pale cone flower. But you can see even though the pale cone flower, it's done flowering, but by mixing this sort of bolder texture um, and a little bit shorter, rounder habit of the um, butterfly weed, and then that more upright kind of twiggy texture <laughs> next to the brown-eyed Susan. Oh, that's the nodding wild onion. Actually a light pink. I'll show you there. But you can see that those tall stems, you're still adding interest. And that's that contrast that I was talking about um, and color. You can see I've got a lot of taller plants here. And again, here's a good example of some of that contrast. So that's that side oats grandma that uh, Stefan was talking about earlier. And in front of it, I've got some butterfly milkweed. So again, even this time of year, they're both done flowering, um, heading into their seed stage and still looking really great. They still provide interest. I'll just show you a couple other things. Brown-eyed Susan, this is one that um, if you guys are, are buying, it's a great garden plant, especially for beginners. You don't know where to start. This is a great plant. It's a steady performer. Um, you have to watch it as a bit of a, a heavy self-seeder. But one thing to watch when you're in the garden center, there is a non-native version that looks fairly similar um, that goes by the same common name. So just when you're buying it, make sure that it's Rutabecchia herta and not Triloba or any of those other ones. Those are non-native. So this one actually is far more drought tolerant um, and looks great. I'll show you a couple of different goldenrods. This is a goldenrod that's just starting. Ohio goldenrod. I'll just zip through here, see if I can show you guys a couple things walk through my garden. <laughs> this is one of our native ryes. Um, very similar, Canada wild rye, uh, very similar to that other um, native rye that's a little bit bigger, taller, the Wagons rye that Stefan had talked about before. The milkweeds, um, they actually, they come back from the plant. But the seeds do gener generally tend to spread themselves around as well. But yeah, all of these, all of these are hardy native perennials, so they will return and come back year over year, um, as well as a lot of them seed themselves around. So this is something again I wanted to show you in silhouette because it's, I think it's beautiful. Like there's a lot of times I enjoy, I want to be able to enjoy my garden at all times of day, all seasons. And look at that big blue stem in silhouette. 
Um, I think it's just beautiful. I've got a sylphium there, a, uh, sorry, a prairie dock. And you can see it just in there, something that's normally a flower that's not, not super strong and bold, but by complementing it with this other fine texture really kind of makes it pop. And I'll just show you here. I've, my garden's gotten a little overgrown, but I did have a pathway through here that this time of year, I'm gonna start probably, while the plants are at their mature size and I know what they're gonna look like, I'll probably start doing some cutting back and some thinning to try and create my garden pathway back through here again. Um, this is a great, great time of year because you know what your plants are sort of uh, looking like and getting into September you can start transplanting things as stuff starts shutting down. If you are going to transplant stuff and move things around um, I recommend generally cutting them back a certain amount that reduces the amount of water lossage that they use as well as making sure that you are watering them uh, well when they're getting established. So. Just to give you an idea too of, of timeline here. So my garden, I planted these. I started most of them from seed about three years ago. Um, did one big planting job with a lot of it. And um, you can see how, how well it's matured. I planted things fairly close and massed and clumped things. It's a great way to get things to fill in quite quickly and mature. Um, so you have a nice full garden. It's reduced, drastically reduced the amount of weeding in here. I hardly ever do much weeding in here. Um, mostly seasonally, like I'll come through, pick out things before they, they go to seed, but the odd weed in my garden doesn't bother me too much. Um, as long as I get it before it goes to seed. I'm just gonna show you guys something quick here. This area right here. So this I had actually just put down some old boards and I put down some cardboard newspaper and I actually took some old, you could, if you had a, an established patch of, of plants, uh, grasses, that sort of thing, if you, and you wanna extend uh, for really cheap, is I chopped up all the, the leaf debris and uh, stems of some of my leftover plants that still had some seeds in the seed heads and just laid it out on here. It worked very well. It controlled some of the weeds and I let those plants kind of start naturally. So that's that's sort of a quick way that I, uh, lazy gardening, I guess, that uh, you can have some good results. So here you can see I've got a little baby Canada rye starting there. And I've added some other things this spring from my cutting back of the rest of the part of the garden. And I've laid out here and I'll be uh, excited to see what comes up next year. How much time uh, do we have here? <laughs> uh, well, we're just about out of time. Um, Oh, sorry, I was just enthralled by your garden. It's beautiful. It's so cool. <laughs> um, maybe we could um, switch over. There's been a, quite a few really awesome uh, questions that were asked. So maybe you and Stefan um, could, uh, could maybe answer some questions that people have. Would you guys be okay with that for another 10 minutes or so? Yeah, would, um, I was just going to say, do, you, uh, do I have another two minutes to just take a walk at some of the kind of native edibles. Sure, yeah, that would be very cool. <laughs> so um, another thing, as I say, like I, I live next to really <laughs> traditional industrial ag. Um, and one of the things that really has reconfirmed for me uh, about what I'm doing is the difference in life that I see on the edge of my yard um, in the summer from the other side to this side and I've got bees and butterflies and dragonflies and frogs and soybeans <laughs> with nothing really living besides soybeans. Um, so it's, it's a really good wake up call. And 
one of my things to kind of separate a little bit um, from that yard is I planted a some fruiting hedges. So if you're in Norfolk, this is a great one. Uh, or sandy soil. I've got hazelnuts. This is our native hazelnut. So those are the nuts coming on there right now. And those are really good. Um, I sometimes I'll roast them. Sometimes I eat them even raw. As long as you dry them, they're really good. I use a nutcracker. Got a couple beehives. There's that wild plum. They haven't, I had one tree with some flowers on it this year, no fruit yet. But again, these are only really three, four years old. And this corner, I wanted to show you as well, because again, I, I try not to, to fight the conditions in my yard or change them as humans like to do. So this corner of my yard generally gets flooding, seasonal flooding. So I like to use plants like our native common elderberry. So you can see they're pretty loaded this year. They like it this year, they like it wet. Um, Aronia, which is black chokeberry, super food in Europe. I don't know why it hasn't quite caught on in, in uh, North America here. I've got some wild black currants as well that are really tasty. So there's a lot of these things that we have. Um, ornamental versions of the, the natives are are just as good it's it's quite funny actually my my uh mom has a number of cultivars at her house and she's always surprised at um how well my elderberries do and uh i'm always trying to convince people i'm like well grow native <laughs> so that's let's i guess uh i'll get off and we should get some questions then Very cool. Super, super cool. Um, okay, well, um, does anybody have questions for Kristen or Stefan about, about your gardens, about native plants, about anything like that? Um, here's one. Um, any recommendations for plants that are good for pollinators but don't take up a lot of room? Sure. Uh, um, do you want to go, Kristen? <laughs> you go. Go for it. Sure. Um, I mean, that's one of the wonderful things about native plants is most native plants are great for pollinators. Um, I mean, minus maybe some of the grasses, but even some of them are host plants. Um, upland white goldenrod is a shorter kind of well-kept goldenrod. Um, sorry, <laughs> traffic. Nodding, nodding wild onion is a great one. There's a lot of bumblebees really love it. Uh, another favorite of bumblebees is uh, that prairie smoke. And that's a nice early one, which is great because there's not a lot of um, spring flowers outside of some of the woodland ephemerals. Um, world milkweed. Most native plants <laughs> that flower and are small, you're, you're, pretty, you're pretty good to go for pollinators. Can I add hairy beard tongue? Oh yes, hairy beard tongue. That's that's the one. If you, if you're thinking about like a pot or just sort of a, a little corner next to the house that you need to fill, something like that, hairy beard tongue might do the trick. That's a great one. Um, okay, here's another one. Uh, starting a shade garden. Are most of the wet shade plants aggressive spreaders? There's a little bit of both. So um, a wet shade thing like cardinal flower is not going to be very aggressive, um, but something like a fringed blue strife or fringed swamp candle, I use that as a filler plant to hold up all my other plants because it does spread and I kind of like that. But you'd want to be aware of that, um, you know, if you don't want a spreader. So there are plants that will do both. Okay, great question. Um, here's another one. I have aphid on my milkweed. Do I need to do anything about that? Oh, I was going to show you. Yes. Um, so I, I, I suspect that they're the little orange apricot aphids. And if they really get out of hand, they can stunt your plant. 
um, and get out of control. I honestly come out every morning with my cup of coffee and squish them in my fingers and just kind of have a good old time squishing little aphids. And it's uh, it's kind of gross, but it's also satisfying. And my fingers haven't fallen off yet. So I just wash my hands after and it's fine. But I mean, you do want to leave some of your pests because if you don't have any pests then you never get the insect predators that control those pests. So I try not to kill all of them, um, especially if they're not really preventing the plant from flowering or pr producing seed. I, I don't really care that much. Yeah, it's the goals and ecosystem, right? You want to create kind of a wild ecosystem. Um, do you find Canada anemone to be very aggressive? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 a, a, yeah. it's a spreader. <laughs> yeah, if it's planted in the kind of appropriate moist soil, it will definitely spread. Um, so give it space or, you know, divide and, and give it to your friends. Yeah, the, the other thing too is, is, I mean, if you're, it's great as a weed control, ground cover, uh, that sort of thing. So if you have an area um, and you interplant it with some, taller plants that are can kind of hold their own that most of their foliage generally is is up above that canada anemone um you've got you've got instant weed control <laughs> yeah Kristen, i can imagine like swamp milkweed coming up yeah. above that yeah that is a great tip um Here's another question. Um, where can you find dense blazing star and how tall are the ones in your garden? I think that was referring to Kristen's garden uh, or maybe Stefan's, I'm not sure. <laughs> it, they, their height sometimes, like a lot of the ornamental uh, cultivars are tend to be much shorter. The true native can be, depending on moisture and nutrients, can be anywhere from um, three feet to six to seven feet high if they're if they're happy <laughs> and uh, there is some available like a number of, a number of native nurseries sell them um, you can also find them online there are some up on the seed box website uh, that Stefan mentioned earlier but a lot of a lot of the small native plant nurseries usually do provide it do they also have plants like giant yellow hyssop? Somebody else mentioned that. Some might. Um, I mean, that's something I know Stefan um, and Seedbox and partners have talked about definitely increasing um, diversity on what's available. And it's definitely a possibility to be available. I'm not 100% I'm not sure with a lot of other nurseries, but. I have a few seedlings going right now, and I certainly have a lot of seeds. So if anyone is looking for hyssop, even for next spring, um, let me know, and I might be able to send you some seeds, or we can grow you some plugs. Or good to know. Um, is it common for some of these plants to not flower in their first year? This person's based in Mississauga. It depends on it depends on the plant. Um, and again, how much moisture and nutrients they're getting. Um, started early, like if it's something that you're starting from a seedling in the ground, generally most things will not flower that first year besides maybe brown-eyed Susan. <laughs> um, but a lot of things the second year should be flowering if, if they're not at least starting to flower you may might want to consider being in a location um, you know try and look up what conditions it likes make sure that you're matching those conditions great tips there okay uh, one last question um, why are there so many rare and interesting legumes in Norfolk ooh okay so I love legumes um so they're actually i think it's the third or maybe fourth most diverse flowering plant family on earth so legumes are diverse worldwide 
including the Carolinian zone in Canada. And that's in part because like orchids, legumes have evolved rather recently and diversified very rapidly because of some of their specialized relationships that they have with pollinators. So they have very um, specialized flowers compared to a lot of other flowers, similar to orchids, but not quite as much. And that has really driven the diversification of legumes worldwide. And it's just no different in Ontario. Unfortunately, some of them are kind of wispy or they're not super showy. Um, so they kind of get missed and overlooked, uh, but they, they're really cool. Also, I forgot to mention, legumes are unique in that they um, have a symbiotic relationship with soil bacteria, which lets them fix nitrogen from the atmosphere so they can kind of fertilize themselves, um, which is unique primarily just to legumes. So that has also helped them diversify as a group. Yes, very great there too. All right. Well, great um, yeah, that was a really Thank great you. question. So many great questions tonight. Um, well, I just wanted to say a huge, huge thank you to Kristen and Stefan. I can uh, pop back on the video here so you can see me. I wanted to give a huge thank you to Kristen and Stefan for coming and for sharing their incredible knowledge and their gardens and all of that thing, all of those things with us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, uh, for everybody who joined us, thank you so much for attending. And, and for those of you that donated, we really, really appreciate it. These are the things that help us bring more programs like this out to all of you. Um, so uh, we'll be sending out an email within a few days. It'll have a link to the video recording. It will have um, uh, hopefully a link to Stefan's, maybe some of Stefan's slides uh, and some other information for you as well. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you all so much for coming and we hope to see you at our next one, which is a garden, uh, sorry, a star party. This was a garden party. <laughs> our next event is a star party that is happening next Thursday. So we hope you can uh, see us there for that and uh, stay tuned. And yeah, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thanks so much for coming. Bye. Thanks.